Amazon Simple Storage Service or S3 is an object storage service that offers scalability, availability, security, and performance. S3 provides management features so that you can optimize, organize, and configure access to your data to meet business and compliance requirements. In this video, let's learn how to get started with using an Amazon S3 from a .NET application. We will learn how to set up, store, and retrieve data from an S3 storage using .NET code. We will also learn some of the key properties and features that you need to know when you're getting started using an S3 storage. Hello everyone, my name is Rahul and welcome back to this YouTube channel. If you're new here, I make videos on .NET, AWS, Azure, and DevOps. Without much delay, let's start learning Amazon S3. Here, I have a default ASP.NET Core Web API using the .NET Framework 6 built using Visual Studio template. As you can see, here we have the program.cs, the weatherforecast.cs, and also a default controller. The controller has a default get method which returns some dummy data. Let's say we need to add a new post endpoint to start uploading files so that we can import weather data from files into this system. As we receive the files, we could store them in a secure storage and trigger off an import in a background process. So let's see how we can add this and start storing this in Amazon S3. So let's come here and add a new HTTP POST endpoint. So let's specify HTTP POST and let's make this a public async and specify the method name as POST. Now to receive a file, we can use the I form file and specify a name for the file. This allows us to upload one single file in your HTTP request. If you want to have other parameters, you can also specify that in this function. For now, let's just stick to one file. Before uploading this file to Amazon S3, let's understand a few general concepts. Amazon S3 is an object storage service that stores data within buckets. Now, an object is a file and any metadata that describes the file. A bucket is simply a container for objects. You can store any number of objects within a bucket. And there is a soft limit of 100 buckets in an account. You can always increase this by visiting the service quota console. Objects are basically the fundamental entities that is stored in Amazon S3. In our case, this would be files that we are receiving from our endpoint. An object key or the key name is a unique identifier for an object in the bucket. So let's head over to AWS console and create a new S3 bucket. So you can navigate to S3 since I recently visited, it's available in this list, or you can just search for S3 inside here and navigate to S3. Currently, I don't have any buckets inside my account. So let's click create bucket. We need to give a bucket name, which needs to be unique globally. So let's name this YouTube-Rahul-Demo Bucket. Now I assume this name is not already taken and let's specify the AWS region as Sydney or you can choose whatever is closest to you. Let's scroll down. Let's leave all the other properties as default and click create at the bottom of this page. This creates a new bucket inside our account. Now since this name was not already used, I was successfully able to create it. Let's navigate into this bucket and we can start uploading objects or files into this bucket. So let's click the upload button and choose add files. I have some data prepared for this example. So let me choose weatherdata.json and click open. Now this selects this file. So let's click upload. Now we have a new object inside our bucket. So as you can see, if we navigate to that object, we can see the different properties that's associated with this. This has a key which is the file name in this particular case. You can also see there is a unique URI with which we can access this particular file. Now that we have seen some basic concepts around Amazon S3, let's head back into our .NET application and do all these steps from code. So let's come back and create a new client to start talking to Amazon S3. We need an instance of Amazon S3 client, which will come from a NuGet package. So if you do control dot, you can see you have to install AWS SDK.S3 NuGet package. So let's click find and install latest version, 
which installs this NuGet package into our application code. Once it's referred, we can start using this Amazon S3 client. To talk to S3, we need to make sure we have the right credentials set up. Now you could explicitly pass in a client ID and secret, but the recommended way is to use managed credentials. I have a separate video on how to set that up, which will be linked here and in the description below. In this particular example, I'm using the managed credentials that is set up inside the AWS toolkit. So if I navigate to view and go to AWS Explorer, you can see the credentials that's set up for this particular account. Now, if I don't specify anything in our constructor, it will automatically use the default credentials factory and pick up the account from the profile default. I highly recommend checking out my video if you're new to managing credentials and using that from a .NET application. On the client object, we can call the put bucket async method to create a new bucket. In this case, it expects a put bucket request. So let's specify a bucket request and define this right above. So let's make sure to make this as a wait because this is an asynchronous method. Now we need to define a bucket request. So let's do that right above this call and create a new put bucket request object. Now this again comes from a different namespace. So let's make sure to include that and specify the bucket request properties. So this needs a bucket name, which would be the name that we had specified. So let's keep this as a variable. So let's specify bucket name. We can explicitly specify a bucket region or use the client region itself. So in this case, let's specify use client region is true. Let's make sure to introduce a new property for the bucket name and give a name for our bucket. So let's specify bucket name is equal to weather forecast YouTube demo. This name needs to be unique globally. So make sure you have some convention based on your application that would make it unique. Now that we have the request and the call set up, so let's press F5 to run the application. It launches the Swagger UI, which is by default enabled for the ASP.NET template. We have the new post method that we have added. So let's click try it out. Let's click choose a file, select a file to upload and click execute. Now this invokes our post endpoint and it calls the put bucket async with the bucket request that we have created. Let's press F5 to continue this execution. Now if we navigate into our AWS console and to the buckets list, we can see that there is a new bucket that is created. So we have the weather forecast YouTube demo bucket. Now if we come back to our application and click execute again, this time this is going to error out because we cannot create a new bucket which already exists. So this shows you the error message. Your previous request to create the name bucket succeeded and you already own it. So in these cases, we need to make sure we are not creating the bucket twice. So let's come back to our code, stop this and make sure to add a if loop before creating the bucket request. So let's add a new property. Let's say bucket exist and use the Amazon S3 util, which has a method to check if a bucket exists or not. Now the S3 util comes from another namespace. So let's make sure to include that and use the method does S3 bucket exist v2 async. The v2 is the latest version that is to be used and specify a bucket name. So let's give in the client, which we already have, and also the bucket name that we are trying to create. So let's make sure to add a await call and use this bucket access property before creating a new bucket. So let's wrap this up inside an if else loop. So if we put a breakpoint here and run this again, let's see what happens. Let's select the post, try it out. Let's make sure to choose a file and click execute. This time the bucket exist returns as true so that it skips the whole creation process. With the bucket successfully created, let's upload the form file that's getting passed into our post endpoint as an object into this new bucket. We'll use the same client instance. So let's specify client dot put object async instead of put bucket async. So we can specify similarly a object request in this particular case. Let's define the object request. So let's specify where object request a new put object request. Now this again takes in a few properties. 
So let's specify the bucket name to start with so that we know which bucket to put this object in. Let's specify a key. So in our case, we can specify the file name. So let's use form file dot name. Let's also specify the stream that needs to be saved. So let's specify input stream, choose the form file and then call the open read stream. This will pass the uploaded files stream as an input stream to this object request. So let's make sure to close this. The name is missing an E. So let's specify that so that it uses the right parameter. Let's also add in the await call. We can capture the response if you want to explore that further. Instead of the form file dot name, let's make sure to use form file dot file name so that we can store the object as the file's name itself. With that set up, let's press F5 to run and test what happens. Let's select the post, try it out, choose a new file, select the weather data.json and click execute. Now this time it skips the bucket creation process and creates a new object request and then uploads that object inside the client. So the response, if you expand, is 200 OK, which means the file is successfully uploaded. So let's continue the execution. Let's navigate to our S3 bucket. Let's go into this and we can see the new file that is created. So we can see the weather data.json file that's uploaded here. So we have successfully uploaded a file using the S3 client. Now if we come back to our application and if we click execute again, it's going to overwrite this particular file. So if we skip this, let's go to the response and you can see this again has a 200 OK. Even though it was the same file, it has overwritten it inside the S3 object. So let's press F5, let's navigate to S3 and click refresh. We still have only one file because this file was overwritten. So if you keep a note of this date, which is 4014 and come back and click execute, after an update, you can see this will change. So let's refresh and this is now 4042. So if these are different files that are getting uploaded, you'll need to make sure that the names do not conflict. So let's come back to our application. Let's stop this and make this name a unique. To make the file names unique, the easiest way would be to append a date time. So let's use string interpolation. Let's make sure to keep the file name as is. So let's specify the brackets and the form file name. Now to specify a date time, let's use datetime.now and we can also specify a formatter in this particular case. So let's format it so that it has the year, the month, the day and also the time. So let's give the hour, month and seconds. So if you can see here, the file name is going to have the year, the month, the days and also the hour, minute and seconds. Let's run this to see how this works. So let's put a hyphen so that it's separate and press F5. Let's click post, try it out, choose a file and click execute. This successfully passes. So let's continue the execution and navigate back to our S3. So let's refresh this and we can see the new file has the date appended to the start. So we have the year, month, the day and the time as we have specified. Now, every time we click the upload, it's going to create a new file inside our S3 storage because the name is unique. So let's click execute again, continue the execution and navigate to S3 and refresh it. And we have the new file uploaded. This is because the seconds are differing in this particular case and also the minute. You could make this further unique if you have IDs generated for these files in your background processes. The Amazon S3 data model is a flat structure. You can create a bucket and the bucket stores objects. Now there is no hierarchy of sub buckets or sub folders within S3. However, you can infer a logical hierarchy if you use specific prefixes inside the key name. Now the console uses the key name prefix slash to represent a folder structure. So let's see how this is going to work. So let's come back to our application. Let's stop this and add in a slash before our date time. So let's say we want to create folders based on the year, month and the day. So the day would be within the month and that would be within the year. So let's introduce a slash so that this will be treated as a folder inside the S3 console. So let's specify a slash and that is going to be the file name, which will be the R minute seconds and the actual file name. Now within the string interpolation, if a slash has to work, 
we will have to delimit it with a backslash, which again has to be delimited by another slash. So let's specify double slash and give the forward slash in this particular case. So let's do that for all of that and run this application to see this in action. So let's choose post, try it out and choose a file and select execute. Let's remove this breakpoint and click F5. This successfully creates that file. So let's navigate back into our S3. Let's refresh this. And you can see this has created a folder, which is 2022. You can also see the type as folder. So if we navigate into that, we can see 03, which is the current month. And then we see 25, which is today. So if we navigate further into that, we can see the actual file that we have uploaded, the weatherdata.json. Now this creates a hierarchy to store your files. To create a new folder, I'll have to come back tomorrow and upload a new file. If not, with the magic of programming, let's come back and specify the date is tomorrow. So let's specify add days and give the value of one, which will simulate it as being tomorrow. So let's click F5 again, select post, try it out, choose a file and click execute. This is successfully uploaded. So let's navigate back to our S3 storage. Let's refresh and we have two folders inside here. So as you upload new files every day, there would be folders created inside this. Once it goes to the next month, it will create a new folder at 2022, create 04 and upload the files under that. This allows you to manage and store files within your Amazon S3 bucket. Each object in the Amazon S3 has a storage class associated with it. Now you can choose the class depending on the use case scenario and performance access requirements. You can see some of the class options and the descriptions in this link. I'll make sure to put this in the description below. So you can see there is an S3 standard, which is the default storage class. So if you don't specify anything, this is the class that's going to be used. Now, if we navigate back to our object, let's go to one of the files. So let's go to the latest file that we uploaded. So if we scroll down, you can see the storage class is set to standard. You can change this even after you have uploaded it using the edit button. But if you want to programmatically set this, you can navigate to your application and specify the storage class when creating the object request. So let's use storage class and explicitly set this value. Now this comes from an enum. So let's use S3 storage class enum and specify the class that you want to use. By default, it is standard. So let's leave it like that. Depending on the storage class that you choose, it also affects the S3 pricing. With S3, you pay for storing objects inside your buckets. Now it depends on the object's size, how long you store it, and also the storage class. So you can look at this table here, which shows the different pricing based on the storage class that you choose for that specific object. If the files are used very infrequently, you can use this in a different class, which means it will cost you lesser. So you will have to pick and choose which storage class is appropriate for your scenario and select that when creating a file. You can also change storage classes after a certain period of time if that's how you want the classes to be. Each time we upload an object, the Amazon S3 also can set object metadata. Now the metadata is simply a set of name value pairs. There are two different types of metadata. One is system defined and the other is user defined. The storage class is an example of the system defined metadata. There are also two types of system defined metadata, one that we can modify and the one that only Amazon S3 can modify. For things like object creation date, we cannot control what value it's getting set. So if we navigate back to our object, and navigate up, we can see the last modified, which is explicitly set by Amazon S3. But certain system defined metadata, like the storage class, can be set by us as well. To use user defined object data, this is optional and we can set it at the time of creation of the object. So if we come back to our application, on the object request, we can specify the metadata and add values to this. So let's specify test as a key and a value metadata. So let's upload this again. Let's click post, try it out, choose the file and click execute. If you navigate into the folder 26 and look at the latest file, scroll down, we can see the new user defined metadata, 
which is appended by x dash amz dash meta and the meta name that we have specified. This has the value metadata. You can also add metadata from the edit button here and click add metadata. Choose a user defined or system defined and specify a value here. So let's say it's test new and new meta and click save changes. Now that we have seen how to upload objects into our S3, let's see how we can retrieve files from S3 storage. So let's come back to our application. Let's stop this and add a new get endpoint to retrieve a file. So let's specify HTTP get. Let's specify a new route name. Otherwise it will conflict with the one above. So let's specify the name as get file and specify the method to be public. Let's specify the return type as I action result because in this case I will be returning a file and specify get file as the name. So let's take in the file name which will be the key of the object inside S3. Now if you are new to return types in web APIs, check out my video linked here which describes the different options that you can use when building APIs. Let's create a new client inside here. Let's specify where client is equal to new Amazon S3 client and use the client to retrieve a file. So we can use the get object async method, specify the bucket name in this case and also the file name which will be the key that is to be used. So let's specify file name and this will return us the object from the S3 storage. So let's add a variable. So let's say response is equal to and add a wait. Now this is getting the file from the S3 storage using the get object async method. To return the file, so let's specify return file which returns as an action result. Let's specify the response dot response stream which will be the response stream of that particular file from S3 and also specify the content type. So let's use response dot headers dot content type. Now when we upload it, this is setting the content type which is exactly what we are using from the headers. So let's make sure to add an async since we have an await and press F5 to test this. So we have the new endpoint get file. So let's click try it out. Let's give a file name. So let's navigate back to our S3. Let's close this and grab the file name for this particular file. So let's copy this key and use this as the file name. So let's click execute and this returns back that file that we have uploaded. So you can see here we are getting the response body which is exactly the file that I am uploading into S3. So if we open the weatherdata.json, you can see that this is exactly the same file that we have been uploading into S3. Now if you want to process the contents of the file on the server, you can do that as well. So let's specify using var reader. Let's create a new stream reader in this case. Let's pass it in the files reader. So let's specify response dot response stream, which is going to create a new stream reader from this response stream from S3. Using this reader, we can get the file contents. So let's specify reader dot read to end async, which is going to return us the string value. Let's make sure to add an await. Let's put a breakpoint here and run this to see this in action. Let's navigate to get file, try it out and specify the same file name and click execute. Now this hits the file contents and we have the file contents inside our code. We can use this to programmatically process this and upload data to our database. This can happen in a separate background process which you can trigger based on S3 file object events. We will see that in a separate video. So let's close this and continue this execution. S3 also supports listing files within a folder or that hierarchy that we have created. So if we come back to our application, let's stop this. Let's add a new method. So let's say HTTP get. Let's have this under the route get files because we are getting multiple files. Let's specify the method as public async i action result and specify it as get files. So let's take in the prefix as the parameter in this particular case. Now again using the same client, so let's specify the client is equal to new Amazon S3 client. We can use the list objects method inside this particular client. So we have a v2 which is what we need to be using. So let's specify the request in this particular case. 
and create a new request right above this. So let's specify where request is equal to new list objects v2 request. Now this takes in the bucket name and also the prefix that needs to be used. So let's specify the bucket name and the prefix as the prefix that we send in. So let's add the wire response and make a wait on this call. So all we are doing is calling the list objects v2 request and calling it on the client. For now, let's simply return a OK result. Let's make sure to make this as a task of I action result because this is an async method and press F5 to run this and see this in action. Let's click the get files. Let's specify a prefix. Let's navigate to the S3 console and let's use this folder prefix. So let's copy up until the day and use this to query that particular endpoint. So let's specify the prefix and click execute. Now in the response here, we can expand this and we can see this has two S3 objects. So in our case, we had two files, which is why we get two S3 objects. Now you can loop through these objects and get the file contents based on those URIs, which we'll be again using the get method that we have written before. So let's continue this execution. By default, the list objects v2 async method supports returning up to 1000 objects. After that, you can use the pagination support given by this request object. So if you want to bulk process files at the end of the day or whatever hierarchy that you have, you could use this to achieve that particular functionality. All the objects and buckets are private by default, which means this is secure and only you can view as you upload these files. Now you can use pre-signed URLs to generate a URL that can be used to access these S3 buckets. These pre-signed URLs can have different policies based on your requirements. Let's see how we can create pre-signed URLs in our application. So let's come back to our code. So with the list of these objects, let's create a pre-signed URL for each of them. So let's fix this response first and let's start using the response.s3 objects. So for each of these objects, let's create a new pre-signed URL. So let's use the client.get pre-signed URL. Now this takes in a pre-signed request. So let's specify a request object and create it inside this select method. So let's create where request as a get pre-signed URL request object. Now this again takes in a few properties. So let's specify the bucket name. So let's give this as a bucket name. And also we have to specify the key for which we need to get the pre-signed request. So in this case, for each of these objects, we have it mapped to O. So let's specify the object dot key in this case. We also need to specify an expires, which determines how long this URL is valid for. So let's say date time dot UTC now dot add seconds and specify 30 seconds in our case. So this URL is going to be valid only for 30 seconds. So for each of these requests, we are creating a pre-signed URL and let's return that in the select statement. Let's make sure to capture this as a variable. So let's specify our pre-signed URLs and use this in our response. So this is going to be an enumerable of strings. So let's return this in our response. So let's say pre-signed URLs. So all we are doing here is for each of the response S3 objects, we are mapping that to a pre-signed URL. Note this is not an asynchronous call, but this is calculated at the client. So let's click F5 to see this in action. So let's click the get files, try it out, and let's specify the prefix. I have this in my clipboard. So let's use Windows V and select the value from here and click execute. Now this gets the pre-signed URLs. So let's execute that. And we can see these URLs in our response. So if we copy one of these URLs and navigate to it, we can see that file that we had uploaded. Now, since we had specified 30 seconds as the expiry, if we refresh after 30 seconds, this is going to say we did not have access. So you get the request has expired and access denied because this URL was valid only for 30 seconds. Now you could pick and choose what time you need to make these files available based on your use cases. In our controller, we have been creating a new instance of the S3 client in each of these functions. 
Let's see how we can dependency inject this client into our controller class. So let's come to the constructor of our controller and inject in an I Amazon S3 interface. We can specify this as an S3 client. Let's make sure to create and assign this field and start using this inside our code. So instead of creating a new client, let's simply use the client that is passed in and remove this line. We can also do the same in the other methods. So let's remove this and use the S3 client. There is one more method, which is the STDB post. So let's remove this again and specify the S3 client instead of using the client. So now we have all the methods using the injected in S3 client. Now to set this up, let's go to program.cs and register the S3 client inside our dependency injection container. So let's call builder.services.add AWS service, which is an extension method that comes from a NuGet package. To install that, let's right click on our project. Let's click manage NuGet packages and let's search for AWS extensions. We can install the AWS SDK.extensions.net core.setup NuGet package. So let's click install and click OK and accept. So this installs the NuGet package. Let's come back to our program.cs and we have the add AWS service method. In this case, let's specify we need to register the Amazon S3 client and make sure to include the appropriate using statements. Now this registers a new instance of the Amazon S3 client into our service collection. Let's build the application. So we have one error where we have missed updating the client. So let's specify this as the S3 client when we are getting the pre-signed URL and also when we are checking for the bucket exist. So let's update those two places. Let's build. It's successfully building. So let's click F5. So let's click the get file method. Try it out and pass in a file name. So let's again use the Windows V to open the clipboard manager and let's select a file that we have uploaded before and click execute. Now this gets the file as expected using the S3 client that is injected into the controller and we can see the file contents as expected from the S3 storage. Now if we need to create a new endpoint, we can easily use the injected in instance. So let's specify an HTTP delete endpoint. So let's specify public async task delete. Instead of I form file, let's simply take the file name. To delete a file, let's call the S3 client. Let's use the delete object async method. Let's pass in a bucket name and also the file name that we have received as part of the input for this particular endpoint. So let's run this to see this in action. So we have the new delete endpoint. Let's come back to S3. Let's pick a file that we know exists and pass it to the delete method and click execute. So if we come back to S3, this file will no longer exist. So let's go to the root folder and refresh that. This file has been deleted. Let's also try deleting this particular file. So let's come back, paste that in the same hierarchy and click execute. Now this file is also deleted. So you can see now there's no folder with the name 26 because we deleted all those files. If we come back to three, we have the files for 25 that we initially uploaded. I hope this helps you to get started with Amazon S3 and use this from a .NET application. We learned about S3 buckets, objects, and how S3 stores these objects inside the buckets. We learned how to create and manage files inside the S3 storage. If you like this video, please make sure to hit the like button. If you have any comments, questions or feedback, drop them in the comments below. If you want to be notified of future such videos, please don't forget to hit that subscribe button. It also helps me to grow this YouTube channel. Thank you and see you soon.